This is episode 250 of the Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts podcast. This episode is titled The Mixtape with Ben Vaughn. Welcome to Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts, the show about stuff we like. I'm your host, Jennifer Crittenden, and sometimes I'm lucky enough to be joined by my co-host, Bill Aho, who has an ear for good music and an eye for the extraordinary. Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts is brought to you by Discreet Guide, a training company for improving your speaking and writing skills. We hope you enjoy the show. This episode is sponsored by Thematic, which is a cool option that I just learned about where you can download copyright free music from a website for use in your YouTube videos or social media or, of course, podcasts. So either background music or sound effects or other uh, audio. And you get this uh, for free in exchange for promoting the artists who participate. So royalty-free music and sound effects, no copyright claims, so no scary letters from attorneys about the music that you're using. And then they have new music that's added every week, and it's safe for your YouTube, social media, podcasts. And then you can sign up for a free account. And with that free account, you'll get five downloads a month, and you also get to participate in their community Discord, which sounds really cool. So you check them out at hellothematic.com and also put a link in the show notes in case you don't have a pencil with you. And good news, Thematic has been kind enough to offer my listeners a coupon for one month free at a higher level, which gives you more benefits. And I'll include a link to that in the show notes also. I'm so pleased to welcome two of my favorites back to the show. Ben Vaughn is with us today. Welcome, Ben. Hello. And Bill Aho is with us to co-host the show. And today we're going to talk about mixtapes, uh, which is actually one of the themes you might say in Bill's and my friendship was uh, exploring mixtapes and sharing mixtapes. And we were very excited that Ben Vaughn was going to come back on the show to talk to us too about mixtapes. So yeah, it's a great morning for me. I'm just going to do a very quick introduction of Ben Vaughn. He was on the show hmm, maybe a year and a half ago, something like that. And so I'll put in a link to that show where we did talk more about his work, uh, which continues to grow. And uh, he's just such a productive and interesting person. But I'll just do a very quick intro for you here so you can place him in case his name is familiar, but you're not totally sure who we've got. I know there are other Ben Vaughns out there. There's a chef and who knows what else is out there. Uh, But Ben has had and continues to have a very interesting career. He grew up in Philadelphia, and in 1988, he began working solo. And you may have heard about the album that he released, uh, including uh, which many, many albums, but including one called Rambler 65 in 1997, in which he played all the instruments and recorded it inside, yes, a car, a 1965 Rambler American. And since then, he's done so much work scoring films, guest appearances. He was a composer for Third Rock from the Sun, a bunch of other TV shows and films. Uh, But appropriate for today, he has a syndicated radio show called The Many Moons of Ben Vaughn. And he continues to produce music on his own and release albums. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Ben. I think one of your albums was released during Record Store Day. Is that right? Yes, I had a Record Store Day album. It was a great experience um, because when I recorded the album, I already knew it was going to come out on vinyl. So I, I recorded it as a side A and side B concept, which I hadn't didn't have a you know I haven't had a chance to do since the mid '80s, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it was it, it was awesome. I was able to resuscitate an old talent, you know. Yeah, I was thinking about that because. Of course, Bill and I started doing mixtapes back in the cassette days, and so we had a slightly shorter format that we had to work with, 
or at least in my mind, that's how I thought of it. Cause you kind of oriented the two sides differently, right? You still had a beginning and an end to each side. And so it just made the format a little bit different. And of course, many moons of Ben Vaughn is quite long, right? Is that an hour show? Yeah, it's a one hour show in three segments. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. So you break it down a little bit too. Well, we can't talk about mixtapes without mentioning Nick Hornby and his book, High Fidelity, uh, because that's what comes to people's mind when they think about mixtape. And so last night I went to go read, I read the book uh, quite a long time ago. I've probably read it more than once. I, I like it a lot and I like him as an author, uh, but I was extremely disappointed when I read his comments about making a mixtape. Uh, and decided that I'm actually not going to read it because I think all three of us know a lot more about mi making mixtapes and the quote unquote rules he calls them about making them. Uh, but I will say that when he put all the discussion about mixtape in his novel, High Fidelity, it certainly caught people's attention and made a lot more people aware of this, I don't know what you want to call it, obsession that some of us have with making mixtapes. So Nick, uh, I'm going to set aside his comments and instead ask the two of you, what do you think makes a good mixtape? Well, for me, when I started doing mixtapes, I took a lot of different inspiration, inspiration from soundtracks, various artists, compilations, making collections that I wanted to hear and making collection for, collections for friends to, to spread new music and new sounds that they might not hear. And of course, the classic mixtape is for courtship. You make it for the other person, hoping that they'll fall in love with you because of the, of the great music you selected. I, I think that's where my fascination came with making a, a mixtape is making my own radio show in a way um, without dialogue but just the music yeah i um i agree with everything that uh, bill just said it depends on who you think is going to hear it mm -hmm. i think that's the first thing you think of is this just for yourself when you're for a long drive or do you want to share this music with a particular person or a group of people i'm actually um i'm guessing that i'm older than you guys because when i was in high school and courting was a thing <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I think uh, it still goes on. It just looks. It is, yeah, they, they, they still call. Yeah, I don't know if they still call it that, but uh, uh, you know, I beseech you, you know, <laughs> to, to, to go to go to the Friday night dance with me. Um, I think that but, was called um, wooing. <laughs> wooing, yeah, wooing and courting and and all that. And uh, I, I'm I'm at the uh, the age that I am. Uh, not everyone had cassette players or. Uh, when I was in high school that came a little bit later mm. uh, so the mixtape was not part of my teenage life mm. what did you do go take your go take your ghetto blaster and play it outside her house like uh, well, John Cusack does I was lucky because I played guitar right it with you ah. and and I the ultimate trump yeah <laughs> And I was in the uh, in a band that played all the high school dances, so uh, I didn't need no mixtape. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> but the technology didn't exist yet. I mean, uh, you know, like like everyone did not have cassette decks plugged into a hi-fi. People were still recording with a microphone to the radio. You know, right. so uh, it, it it came in the mid seventies. I'm guessing is when that technology caught up with teenagers and the ability to put together a mixtape and impress a young lady or a young man with how awesome <laughs> your musical tastes are <laughs> and how they should w worship the ground you walk on because you're like an elevated musical individual, you know? <laughs> but, uh, or just high, not elevated. It, it, just high. Yeah, well, yeah, like, yeah. Is there a difference? Uh, <laughs> But um, I started making mixtapes um, later on when I was in a touring situation. I would make uh, mixtapes for the to listen to in the van for the whole group to listen to, and that was where my mixtape thing really came in. And that's when people started telling me I should have a radio show because those tapes started getting duplicated, and other bands would start listening to them in their vans when they were on tour. And this is like in the in the early '80s. That's great. And that's when I realized that my musical taste and, and the way I put songs together and mix genres was palpable. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, it wasn't too weird and, and the turns weren't too drastic. The changes that you go through when you listen to a mix of my stuff on paper, it looks, I don't know, it, it looks, you know, schizophrenic maybe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to have Charles Mingus come after the Stooges, which comes after Dolly Parton, you know, mm-hmm. That's, um, that's what we did too. The same thing. I mean, that's just part of the process. I think is get as much of the cool stuff in there that you can. Yeah, and it has to work musically. You know, it can't be just like you know, I'm going to make a point here. Yeah, right. A conscious point. There's a there's a the, your subconscious is involved as you're picking this music, as you're listening. You know, all of us when we enjoy music, our critical minds can only be there so much, and then something deeper is happening. That's why music is the greatest most liquid art form it it really can really affect you in a way and it can affect you um and it can hit you when you least expect it because music shows up when you're getting a, a tire fix the radio's on you might hear a song and go oh my god mm-hmm. i forgot how much i love that song mm-hmm. or you could be you know in a pizzeria you could be anywhere in your car and you know from for me putting together a mix there's a zone I kind of go into that's less, my conscious mind is only there so much, you know? Well, we talk about the format of the cassette tape, but I actually have some old reel to reels that were kind of put together as a kind of a mixtape in itself, um, where people would take different things from their records or from the radio and they would put it together onto a, a reel to reel. I mean, it wasn't as portable, but it gave you a chance to make kind of a, a party mix for when people came over or something. So I think that's probably the first kind of form of that besides the radio. And then came the cassettes and the CDs. And then of course the digital component, which how, what do you think about it? It kind of gives you a chance to make your own mixtapes with a, with a Spotify playlist or things like that. And the internet radio, of course, which also gives you a format of a mixtape in a way. I have a I have a question. Has there ever been a romantic mixtape that does not include Al Green? <laughs> yes, yes, but maybe they, it wasn't very good. But, but it should have, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, might, it might have had Barry White instead. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, that's interesting what you say about reel to reel tapes because that's that's really like harder work. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, you actually have to thread a reel. It's like having a projector in your bedroom, you know, <laughs> you have to thread it. Uh, so um, I'm, I was always impressed. I had an uncle who was a hi-fi fanatic. He's the guy who turned me on to rock and roll, actually. Mm-hmm. He gave me my first record when I was six years old, a Dwayne Eddy album, which oh. put me on the path. Mm-hmm. Uh, like my mom said, uh, you know, I, I, I've been running from the devil ever since. That's what she <laughs> said, how she describes it. And, uh, but I would go over to his apartment and he had a reel to reel and he, he had, you know, he was like a, one of those early 1960s stereo hi-fi fanatics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I remember he would play reel to reel mixtapes that he made. Now that I think about it, I haven't thought about that since you mentioned it, mm-hmm. but I, yeah, I did witness that. So I guess that was the original format. Yeah, my dad did that too. And I'm trying to think why, because we certainly had albums and, a, um, record player but you know one of the problems with having a record player at parties unless it's really the center of attention is you have to constantly babysit it because the the albums aren't that long so i think he would make those real long long reel-to-reel tapes so that it could play in the background while we were having a party and then he wouldn't have to keep constantly be changing the records but yeah i it's a little bit different, I think, with the cassette tapes, and maybe that's why I'm sort of sentimental about them, is because they are perishable. You know, the the old cassettes that I have from way back when, well, I don't, you know, it's hard enough to find equipment to play it on or any kind of quality equipment, and so they're kind, they're unique and they're perishable. So they're a moment in time, right? Well, it's, it's like, yeah, in the library world, they were called ephemeral. Probably. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It was it wasn't meant to last beyond that moment when you were excited about those songs. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you were trying or you were trying or or you had that audience in your mind of who you were making the tape for. And so it makes it ephemeral. 
automatically, but, but also the fact that the format was one that does not age well or store well mm-hmm. would, would also place it there. I, I just remembered a funny uh, mixtape story. A friend of mine was getting married in the late 70s, and he asked me to make a mixtape for the wedding reception. Oh, what? <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I'd almost get married again just so I could hear your <laughs> mixtape for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I made this. I spent a lot of time on it, you know, and it was sure. a big success. It was a big success. Every, everybody was happy with it. And I had a job as a paste-up artist back then. So, And I thought, you know, this mixtape is so good. It's a standalone piece, regardless of the wedding. I'm going to bring this into work. We had a cassette deck at work. Mm-hmm. And I put the tape in, and I'm really proud of myself. I'm thinking, this is like, I transcended the wedding, and I just made this fantastic. <laughs> and have, so about three songs into it, this older guy goes, what is this, a tape from a wedding reception or something? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's like when somebody <laughs> figures out who the murderer is in the first three pages. Like, yeah, yeah, no. yeah. I, uh, yeah, it completely. Da- I, I, I almost didn't become a DJ because of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, was, it, it was traumatic. <laughs> or it made you a much better DJ, probably. Yeah, yeah, no wedding songs, uh, you know. <laughs> Well, they, they, but they got the what the gist of what you were creating. I mean, yeah, I mean, really, yeah. that's what it was for. Yeah, I know. I I I had um, a ma- reimagined it in my mind as a as a uh, universal a universal masterpiece, <laughs> which, which it was not. <laughs> I think the worst one that I did actually was quite recent, and I. I'm surprised that I made such a, a newbie mistake, uh, but I made a mixtape for my husband for our 28th wedding anniversary. And so I wanted to use a lot of songs that referred to 28. And so, I, I mean, there were other songs in there too, you know, about um, time and love and, you know, those kinds of things, those, those old topics, right? Yep. Um, but I was trying to focus on 28 and that led me down some wrong paths. I think, um, I wasn't very happy with that mixtape. I think it's one of the, one of the worst that I've done. And, and so that's kind of a, you know, something to think about, because I think a lot of times we do make mixtapes with the theme in mind, but we have to be a little careful that the music doesn't get lost in our attempt to pursue a particular theme. And I think that's where I went wrong with mine. So like, if you had, if you played that for me with no explanation, I would probably three songs in to go, what did somebody turn 28? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. And I was trying not to use songs that were about the age of 28. So that further restricted me. I mean, the restrictions wow. I don't think were necessarily bad. It's just that, I think usually I make a mixtape that's more about the music, that's more about the transitions. So that where does your mind go when you hear this song? And then I'm going to move. You well, that's see, that's song. exactly right. What what you did is you were editorializing uh, okay. with your con with, with your conscious mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to, and and um, I can't think of a single song that has 28 in I it. I can't either. Uh, no, oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> really? But, but I also, because of that, you know, when you just think of them off the top of your head, you're not going to come up with very many. And so I had to do a lot of research to find them. And so then they don't necessarily go together musically, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. The thing, the thing with the cassette mixtape, so if you manage to preserve them well enough, whenever, whenever I go back to one, it's like a like looking at a photograph. I, I go right back to when I'm making it, it seems like, I mean, that, that time, that, that week, I mean, I, I can kind of visualize, it brings me just back like a photograph. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of a neat feeling when you, when you play one to me. Yeah. I've never done that. <laughs> I've never <laughs> done, going backwards for me, you know, as a creative artist, I'm sure you, you guys too, you know, whatever you're working on, you're working on the next thing. And so uh, as far as my songwriting and me making records or producing records or whatever, I never go backwards. And even like looking at a box of old photographs, it's really cool for a little bit. And then I start to feel nauseated. Like it's a, it's a, it's like weird jet lag to me. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a weird stimulation to the brain. Yeah. And the emotions. And then you start, there's like, and then, and your body starts to feel different based on it too. It's very strange. Yeah. Uh, you're weird. 
<laughs> one, I'm not that nostalgic of a person. That's what uh, I was just going to say. It's almost like you have a reaction to nostalgia. I do, I guess. Yeah. Which does sound like it. No, no, that I say it. Nostalgia does sound like a disease, right? Right. That Gia ending. Well, for yeah, some people. Creepy. Fibromyalgia, <laughs> nostalgia. Right, exactly. you know? and, and, and they have a pill for that now. I saw a commercial the other day. Do you have nostalgia? <laughs> very very it, it, side it effects. Can, you know, it can cause all these really bad effects, mm-hmm. including death. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, including death. And, and, and it can also, cre- if you take too much of it, can create nostalgia. That's the weird part. <laughs> it gets worse and worse. Yeah. <laughs> I've had this before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like nostalgia all over again. <laughs> when when making the mixtapes, Jennifer and, and Ben for you doing your show and stuff, what do you what inspires you to use the songs you use? I mean, if you're just kind of doing it spontaneous. For me, I I tend to use things that are kind of surprising along with current and along with things I just think are nice, which includes cover songs, B sides, where you get some sign it it's not easily available, but it's like it's a good song. Old one hit wonders, stuff for new releases. And I tend to go to a lot of unique fun songs to break it up. A couple I wrote down was like Brave Combo is one of those. And also some of Ben's songs I find to be really mm-hmm. um, fun to break things up with. I mean, mm-hmm. I got a wig or Jerry Lewis in France. I mean, I dig your wig, not I got a wig. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm looking at you right now. It looks like real hair. <laughs> but but those what i would kind of go through and make in a tape besides whatever else i wanted to throw in there as far part of a theme or whatever how about you guys yeah i think the more successful ones that i've done were when i was inspired maybe by a couple of songs like i remember discovering that there are just these amazing musicians who sing in spanish that are just incredibly popular in South America or Mexico that I'd never heard of. And they have just these mega hits and they're super fun and accessible. So I know I made a double CD of those and people really enjoyed those because they, like me, didn't know about that music and and the musicians are so good. So yeah, that, you know, introducing people to new music, I think is a big inspiration. I think I did another one. There was sort of a new sound coming out in this, you know, alt alt country, Americana, fun, interesting songs. I think I probably got inspired when I started hearing more uh, Andrew Bird songs. Yes, it'll usually be something that kicks it off like that. And I think, oh, people should know about this. And then I'll go from there. Yeah, with me, me, I'm uh, more of a music historian. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a big part of what I do. So I'm always going, and, and for someone who's not nostalgic about my own life, I'm, <laughs> nostal- I'm nostalgic about other people's <laughs> you ah, know? Right. And, their mu- and their music. And I'm always, go- I'm always digging and digging and seeing what came out mm-hmm. that fell through the cracks. But when I was, uh, I guess when I was about 14 or 15, underground radio uh, came on, FM radio in Philadelphia. And we had freeform radio. We had two underground FM stations that were completely freeform. The disc jockeys were allowed to play whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they played current stuff like, you know, Iron Butterfly or whoever was, you know, Hendrix. But they also, these guys uh, and and, and women too, uh, we had had a few women uh, disc jockeys, they would slip in Charles Mingus or a spoken word poetry record or a folk record from, you know, 20 years before. And that was my training. I listened every night and I would record that every night with, with a microphone to the speaker oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and listen to that stuff. So my inspiration comes um, very naturally to me. Like when I'm, what, what I felt that the, that those disc jockeys were doing was a service that they were sharing mm-hmm. what they were passionate about and sharing music that needed to be heard. And I felt like I was on the receiving end of something really incredible. When I put my radio show together, that's the whole thing. Is like when I hear a piece of music, I go, wow, who can I play this for? Immediately. That's my first reaction. Who can I share this with? Who needs this? Who will get this? Mm-hmm. 
And that's uh, pretty much what's behind what I choose. I know I have an audience when I'm choosing it. And I'm very excited about that because I get a lot of messages and emails from people who say, where did that song come from? It's my new favorite piece of music. Uh And it it feels great. Yeah, it feels great. And so it's really like a two way street, the audience and and me, the the, um, communication and the sharing is why I do it. It's it's really it's, it's very rewarding. It is. I mean, when people come back to you and say, oh, what was that song? And because I don't always label my mixtapes very well. Sometimes they're just kind of thrown together. But people would ask, would they want to find out who it was because it struck something with them? And and same thing for me. If I hear a song that I really didn't know or for an artist, a lot of times I'll go down that rabbit hole for a while and just soak up as much of that as I can. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm hoping. Hap- that's what I do when I hear a song by an artist I'm, I never heard of before. I explore their entire catalog almost immediately if I like the song. Yeah. If I don't like it, I don't, you know, obviously. But. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the song you heard is the best one, but you never know. A lot of times there's a lot more best ones. Yeah, that's really true. There might be an album track by that artist that's better than the song that first got you in, you know, the first pulled you in. That's always the dream. <laughs> yes. Well, the dream, the dream is for an album to have all good songs on it. That's the dream. Every album you buy or every one that you make for all 12 songs or however many are on there, where every one is great. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was thinking. So one thing that Nick Hornby does say about mixtapes, which I which I think is probably true, is that it's like a letter and it is communication. And it and it's an interesting way to communicate because it doesn't use your own words. Right. So you're using somebody else's music to say something that you want to say. But it's interesting that you say that because um, back in the early days of rock and roll, the big thing on radio stations was requests and dedications. Right. Where people would call in and and they would say, could you play Soldier Boy for Tommy? You know, this is Vicky. Could you play it for Tommy because he's he's uh, going to the draft board tomorrow or, you know, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Right. Or could you play, uh, you know, please forgive me and dedicate it to so-and-so because I, I blew it and I want her to forgive me. Mm-hmm. The, and that those records could express what a teenager could not express. Right. Could not say to the other person, we're not poets when we're teenagers and we are not, uh, we're, we're very inarticulate at times when we're that young. And you would call the radio station and ask them to play a song for that special someone and that person would hear that song and they would know how you feel about them. And everyone would know it that's listening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back when I was listening to when radio was actually good, AM radio, <laughs> FM radio. Ouch. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have a radio show. Hello. <laughs> I know, but you're different. I mean, really. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But the, um, <laughs> the one that really I thought was one of the best ones as far as bringing new music to me was um, the old Mexican radio station, the one that was across the border and they broadcast really loud and it was Huggy Bear and people like that. And this music was just incredible that what they would find and what they would play. Yeah, that that's a legendary. You're right. I mean, that's a that's a legendary example of that. I mean, that was I was so sad when that disappeared. I mean, that was that was so wonderful. So you you heard that. Actually, oh, yeah. like, oh, wow. See, I'm from the East Coast. We, you know, we never we, we've heard about was it what was it? X, X, E, R, K or something uh, like that. So or Wolfman remember. Jack, Wolfman Jack. Um, Huggy was, Bear was the one that really I, I would catch because he'd be in, in the evening. He'd be and he'd do dedications and he would just play this great. A lot of doo-wop and 50s and 60s. And it was this great. Yeah, that that's probably the original mixtape. The requests and dedications, even though you were only only able to, it was curated by a group of people, you know, um, but you were able to get one song in there. And that's the letter that you were talking about, you know, the letter to someone. And uh, and then eventually, you know, with technology, we were able to make our own tapes and inundate the person with multiple songs. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. Yeah, here's 30 songs. Yeah, and I was thinking what uh, full circle here because the Blasters have that song "Border Radio," yeah, which is, a, which is about that 
Right. So yeah, this goes out. This song comes from 1962, dedicated to a man who's gone. And she's right. hoping that he hears it on border radio. Yeah. And they were loud. They, they had a strong signal being in Mexico. They could be heard pretty far. Yeah, because they didn't have the FCC rules as far as wattage. Right. So they had a transmitter that was, I, I think it reached, you know, the Midwest, even like up in Wisconsin and places like that. Wow. But it didn't hit New Jersey. We, we uh, I think it, sh- it, you know. I think it avoided New Jersey like a lot of it. <laughs> I was going to say there's probably a force field around New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we ain't going for it. <laughs> <laughs> but but you you guys had your own people that did that kind of thing that you would listen to. I mean, oh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia was the capital of that kind of thing. We had the Geeter with the Heater, Jerry Blavitt, mm-hmm. who was on every night and he was notorious for reading dedications and taking um uh, request but he also had this um at 11 o'clock at night he would play all ballads and it was called for lovers only and he would give advice on teenage romance oh. every night and it was fantastic it was uh it was a, a beautiful thing and it was extremely popular mm-hmm. extremely popular in philadelphia to the point where he was on a station that did not have a uh, high wattage. It was in Camden, New Jersey, which is where I'm from. And his he he broadcast from the top floor of City Hall in Camden because the station was owned by the city of Camden. But the transmitter was on the river, right on the other side of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia teenagers would drive and park along the river on the Philadelphia side so that they could listen to him every night. Wow, that's in, that's a, that's great. Yeah, and they would request a song. They would send in a request because you can mail them in too. And because, you know, teenagers didn't have cell phones then, so they couldn't call from their car and ask for a song. Mm -hmm. So they also sent in requests and he would read them. And, you know, a a couple would be in a car together and their song would come on with a dedication. That's that's cool. Special moment for sure. Yeah, it was a classic, um, a classic scenario. Mm -hmm. I hope that some of those are archived somewhere, some of those shows. I, a lot of times they're lost forever, but... Uh, they aren't, uh, but I found a treasure trove of unopened requests and dedications. I was oh. friends with... I, I became friends with the Geeter with the Heater. Actually, I became uh, a stalker, would be... That would be... <laughs> <laughs> more, more accurate. <laughs> yeah, more accurately, a stalker, and I was so enamored of him. I wanted to be him when I was a kid. I listened to him every night, and I went to his dances... And I would dance at his dances and everything. And uh, as an adult, I got to know him and we became really good friends. And I was helping him clean out a storage space. And I found a bunch of unopened requests and dedications from 1962. Oh, boy. And we went on the air and he opened them and played the requests and read the dedications. And uh, we can include a link to that if you, if you want your listeners to hear that. It's, it's really powerful and really emotional. It's called The Lost Dedications. And it aired in Philadelphia about two years ago. And the response, a lot of the people who actually wrote those letters heard the show. And it was it was really, yeah, it was like a message in a bottle that had been discovered. And it really um, it was a very emotional, very powerful experience. Sounds like it might have even rekindled some old romances. Who knows? You never know. You never know. Or, or sparked a new fight. That's right. <laughs> who, who was who was that Debbie? Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or, or or oh oh now you apologize sixty years later. <laughs> <laughs> but I sent it to you. I sent it to him sixty years ago. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mix mixtapes gone awry. Or something. Exactly. Mixtapes gone wrong. <laughs> One of the problems that I have, so I love all this new technology. I'm I'm one of those people that thinks it's really great that it's so accessible and affordable and you don't, you know, it's not so much hard work. But I do struggle with some of the technology. And one of the things I remember having trouble with, with some of the devices that I was using is that they would jumble the playlist into a mixtape person. That's just, I mean... You may as well throw it away, right? I mean, if if you can't keep the order of the songs 
consistent and stable as it goes from to device to device, then but why do it at all? At least that's that, my, my opinion. That is an, an alarming thing when I first discovered that with modern technology, like, whoa, the reshuffling. I didn't ask for this mm-hmm. to be reshuffled. Mm-hmm. Or not even reshuffled, shuffled, I guess, because yeah. re- that's redundant, reshuffled. Uh, <laughs> but but I I was shocked. I was like, all that work, and now I can't figure out how to how to consistently have this play in the order I intended on every device with everyone I send it to. I'm not. I don't. I don't have confidence. It's going out properly. It's an outrage. It's a total outrage. It is. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna. I'm pounding my fist right now. <laughs> oh. well, it, something it making, needs to be done. Something it needs to be done about this. <laughs> in, in making those tapes, one of the big things was the segue, yeah. and you you'd play it back, and there there might be that white combination that just works so perfectly. You just go, wow, that that went together. Just the timing was right. I mean, everything worked out really well. I mean, I would go and someone taught me if I count the spins of the record on the label. I could know exactly when the song was going to start. So I would I would get as close as I could to the beginning of the song. And a lot of times it just worked so well. And other times it was like surprising that I could get a, a, a cool segue. One time I was recording one and the plug came loose in the turntable. So it started just to go slower and slower and slower. So I put another record on and plugged it back in and it came back up with a different song. And I thought that was kind of fun. Mm. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. great the thing the thing that um always uh drove me nuts is when the last song on side one was actually too long to be the last song on oh, side oh, one i know so and you got to go back you're like oh i know you have to rearrange everything <laughs> yeah and then you got to read the label that was three minutes and 48 seconds so i probably need something that's 238 <laughs> you know and and uh you know that's that's uh a buzzkill. Yeah. I forgot about that. But yes, there was there was actually quite a lot of calculating that had to be done. I forgot about that. Uh-huh. Yeah, cuz it's just lame to do a fade out, right? Yeah. That's for that's for amateurs. Yeah, especially if it's not really not really supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah, we do that on radio all the time, fade outs cuz you're coming up at the 20 minute mark and it's like, well, uh we'll be back, uh, you know, after this commercial break and you just ramp it down like <laughs> with no <laughs> finesse whatsoever you know <laughs> and if you listen if you listen to radio there are a lot of bad segues songs come in too too soon after the one that just ended all the time now i think there's a insecurity about it, the attention span of the audience mm-hmm. yeah where anything that resembles uh subtlety is probably you know going to lose the audience and so they slam these songs into each other and it really uh, offends my sensibilities when I hear that because it's like uh, it's not necessary. I agree. And, and now I'm going to think of you every time I'm at a wedding and some <laughs> DJ does that. They're so paranoid that people are going to leave the dance floor that they actually start playing the songs on top of each other. So you have this moment of, you know, just complete mind blowing mishmash, which, yeah, I, I, that's just horrible. It's horrible. Horrible. Well, you know, the obvious uh, fix here is just don't go to weddings. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I have a great wedding mixtape from 1978 for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked this friend of mine how she t- so she likes to go to these exercise classes. I won't provide too many more details but i did say well, how do you t- how do you tolerate the music and she said i wear earplugs whoa <laughs> so i could i guess i could go to weddings and just wear earplugs <laughs> i went i went to a yoga class once which uh once uh, <laughs> and you get my drift <laughs> and they had and they had music they were playing music mm-hmm. and i was like i'm too um um I'm too much of a musician and too much of a musical thinker to be able to block out music. I can't do it. Yeah. Right. Like if if I get a massage and they put on new age music, I'm like, could you just turn that off? And they're like, what? I know. Like, you know, I'm in this holy sanctuary and I'm asking them to turn the, the, whatever flute that is that's being played. 
and there, and I said, I'm my my mind is too analytical. You know, I'm I'm, I'm I pay attention. Yeah. When, when music is on, I'm, I I I don't know how to. I don't know how to have music as back as background. I it, it's always foreground information to me. I think that's true of all of us. I mean, as far as us three, because making mixtapes, you want to be able to experience it, and after a while, any music you hear, you want to experience it, and you can't you can't really turn it off. Yeah, I have trouble. Like if I'm in a diner and uh, having a conversation with somebody, and Dion and the Belmonts come on, I'm paying attention to Dion and the Belmonts automatically, which is really bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's a bad social skill but i'm like oh my god i forgot how great they were dion and the belmonts were awesome and my friends saying hello i was just telling you <laughs> yeah, my, my, my divorce mar- yeah yeah my, i'll, my, I'll my be back in two minutes <laughs> my, marriage, my marriage is falling apart and what are you talking about <laughs> for me one of the worst is music because it's such a perversion of usually of the original song that sometimes it's hard to recognize what it is. And so your brain is just working away at this problem. Like, what the hell is this thing that they've made turned into this, you know, this goop that we're hearing on the elevator? When I was a kid and I would go to the doctors, I'd be sitting in the waiting room and they'd be playing music. And this is like early 60s music. And I was too young to understand, like, you know, life, basically. <laughs> and I recognize the songs because they were Beatles songs or they were, you know, hits of the day, but they were being played with these arrangements with, you know, low piano notes and strings and, mm-hmm. and uh, occasional vocal chorus coming in. And the only place I ever heard that music was in the waiting room at the doctor's office. So <laughs> uh, I said to my mom, oh, is this music performed by doctors? <laughs> Like I had a picture in my mind of a bunch of guys wearing white smocks in a recording studio <laughs> playing violins because music, music by doctors for doctors. I mean, it made perfect sense to me. And my mom was like, well, you're weird. <laughs> oh, <just> <laughs> but I really did think that I really did think that uh, like I, I didn't hear it anywhere else. So, you know, it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was always surprised when you hear a song that that was turned into music and you would think why would they have picked this song to make it as music something really weird or that you wouldn't even expect to, to hear the original song somewhere yeah like green tambourine or something <laughs> or yeah. coke or cocaine i mean for a while there it seemed like a lot of the music mixes were including cocaine but done as music it's like hmm. really like da na 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 Da-da. Wow, I would I would like to hear that actually. It's very strange, especially when you know you're the only person there who knows that the name of the song is Cocaine. That's funny. Yeah, that's um, well, music. You know, being a music fanatic will make you the only person. Sometimes it's it's a lonely pursuit if you're really obsessed with music because sometimes you're completely on your own because the rest of the world does not care about what you're currently excited about it's just part of the deal you know but what's amazing to me and you guys have all experienced this is when you do make a high quality or what i think is a high quality mixtape what appreciation there is out there for it like people really recognize that skill right that and they're and they appreciate that they they get it you know which you you think they might not and maybe not everybody would but I, I'm always surprised at how much appreciation I get from people when I uh, provide a mixtape. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. I think it just, you know, people love music. And if you go to the trouble of curating for them and they're willing to listen to it based on your previous work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dep- Warning. Depends on, you're only as good as your last mixtape. <laughs> ah, I better get on the stick because, yeah, that my last one was maybe not so strong. Yeah, yeah. I had some friends back in Michigan. And I had given them a tape, and um, they said they are playing it in their backyard while they are out doing stuff. And their neighbor came over and said, what are you playing? I can't find that station. So uh-huh. that that's what? what's nice validation for me. And, and for them, it was like, wow, people are, are listening to what we're playing here too yeah i was playing a bunch of records once in my apartment and the guy next door came over and 
and knocked on the door. I'm thinking, oh man, I got to turn it down. Mm-hmm. And I, I opened the door and go, I, uh, yeah. And he, and he goes, what was that song three songs ago? What was that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's really listening. I thought yeah. he was going to come over and ask you to turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he almost did, but, for, sure. but I, I, I got out the record and I played it again. And, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a song by the incredible string band, a really weird song oh, too. Uh-huh. And uh, he became an incredible string band fan because of the paper thin walls in an apartment <laughs> building. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those are the best stories really to me. It was turning somebody on and they admit that they got it from a certain sign that you played for them or they heard from you. Yeah. It's, it's a great thing. Somebody, People give me mixtapes when well, they used to, you know, when I used to tour in America. But if they give them to me in New York. Some, somebody, um, I just got back from touring in Spain, and someone gave me a CD of Spanish rock and roll bands from the 60s for me to listen to. And I listened to all that stuff uh, that people give me. But back in the 80s, people would, would give me tapes. And I remember one in particular, I can't remember who gave it to me, a guy in Pittsburgh. And it had, oh, it had these really obscure R&B tunes and a Nat King Cole song that is like my favorite. Now my favorite Nat King Cole song is called You're Looking at Me. Mm. And I was a Nat King Cole fan and I did not know that song. So he, you know, you know, he handed me a tape in Pittsburgh in a dressing room and changed my appreciation of Nat King Cole. That's so yeah, cool. Perspective, perspective changed some. It definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It really is a gift. You know, when you when you turn somebody on to music that it turns out that they really get a lot out of, it's really a gift. And and nowadays it's hard to turn people on to music because it's so individualized. I mean, I guess the Spotify playlist you can share with somebody, but most people are just listening to their own stuff, walking around and doing stuff. They're listening in a car maybe and you can play stuff for other people, but it depends on the time tra- you're traveling in the car. But there's not many ways to really share music so people can learn new stuff yeah i feel really lucky to have a radio show for that reason um i'm able to scratch that itch every week because there are so many so many great pieces of music out there that no one's ever heard you know and i uh, i love the response i get but um your yeah, radio is kind of the last play i don't know how I, I really don't have a full grasp of modern technology and how people consume music or whether they even buy anything anymore if they just subscribe to a service where they can put together a playlist without buying individual audio files. I, I'm not up to speed with it. I still like the physical copy of something because to me, then I, I know I have it. It's not going to disappear at some, some point. Yeah, but that's, all, that's great until you have to move. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Just, I'm not going to move ever again. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. your your record collection demands it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Ben, I've I've seen your web page or your Facebook page, and a lot of times you're gonna you lay out all your records that you're picking from to to play in your show. How do you decide which records are? Is this kind of like looking through your collection, and say, ah, oh, this one, this one? Yeah, I well, I I, I I listen to them. I put them on a turntable. You know, I have I have listening sessions. I lay on the living room floor and I'm surrounded by records and I, and I play them on the turntable and I make a playlist up. And then because album artwork, especially LP album artwork is so unbelievable, you know, a 12 inch square space, like an empty canvas for an artist yeah. or a photographer or designer, a layout artist. And uh, I'm in love with album covers and they are very um simulating very exciting to look at and so i what as i'm selecting my songs once i get my playlist together i'll pick four or five of them and i'll lean them up against my record shelves and take a picture of them and post it and that gets a great reaction too because some of the some of those album covers are so cool looking you know oh yeah and and some are just bizarre yes i mean there's some you go (laughs) there's a there's sites for the worst album covers and there's there's ones you just go, what were they thinking? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I kind of collect ones that have weird clowns on them. And it's like, why would people even put a clown on a on a country record? Or things, I mean, it's one where the guy, the clown is in the out in the desert kind of thing, looking around, looking for the circus, and it's a country record. <laughs> uh, <laughs> creepy. That's a, <laughs> creepy. That's a, yeah. That, uh, I have uh, no reaction to that. 
<laughs> we're, we're just dumbfounded. Yeah, we we, we have no answer for you. Yeah. But, but, other than other than you win. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, yeah, Bill. Bill has won the podcast. Yeah, I got not. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> what I was thinking about was when I make a mixtape, it takes me forever. Uh, because partly because I'm in love with the music. So I have to hear it over and over. And then I have to try this transition and that, and maybe this would work better at the end. And I mean, I enjoy it, right? It's not, I, I take my time doing it because I enjoy doing that. But I was thinking for you, Ben, this might be pretty dang time consuming. Um, it can be. I, I have a, um, I kind of go in the zone, you know, uh, uh, ever since I was a kid, like learning instruments was easy for me. Like I first time I got behind the drums, I actually could play with it without, you know, ever having sat behind a kit before. And I was automatically in a band as a drummer. There's something going on with me that's visceral mm -hmm. that I move. I, I actually move fast mm -hmm. uh, when, when I'm curating and when I'm writing and when I'm, you know, creating music and recording music and everything. I, I um, it isn't as much of a conscious experience as you might think. Mm. I think a lot of musicians are that way. I, I don't think I'm unusual, uh, but I'm a lifelong musician. You know, I've been doing this since, you know, I've been playing in bands since I was 12 years old, obsessed with music since, you know, I was like six or seven. And it, it works in a way that, you know, like down there in the subterranean, subterranean precinct of the subconscious mind, something's going on there. And I'm trying to keep up with it as opposed to taking a long time above the surface thinking about things i kind of go into a uh it's more of a physical experience for me it's hard to explain for that reason mm -hmm. i think one of the things that i enjoy about it is it allows me to hear the songs a little bit differently like i'll think oh maybe this song would go here and then i discover oh i'd never really noticed before that it has this you know sort of weird drum intro or you know a, a particular note that they play first before the song gets going you know i hear it um in more detail yeah you, you, you well you'd hear it because it's it's important to the segue yeah. yes exactly like if a song is fading out, it's good to have a song with a with a drum hit in the intro to kick you back in because fade outs, you know, they they can become silence in the you know like like if you're in a noisy place, a long fade out can sound like dead air. Yeah, or an abrupt ending followed by a very and different abrupt beginning. Right? It's like ah, but, yeah, but yeah. that's but that's part of what takes me a long time because I'm actually listening to the song more carefully than I had before. Yeah, I kind of have uh, a lot of that stuff memorized in my head. Like if you name a song, I'm like, oh, drum intro, no, ba bass walk up. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, you know, it's an illness. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuff you want to purge, but can't. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just the way I, 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 I think I, you know, I don't have a photographic memory, but I have a um, phonographic memory, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I definitely. New word. Like I always thought that if I, you know, was in solitary confinement for whatever reason, I can't think of what crime I would commit that would put me there. But if I bad was, I could, tape. I, bad I could bad mixtape, yeah. <laughs> I I could yeah bad mixtape. <laughs> I, I I could replay almost every song I've ever heard in my life in my head. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! I can do some songs that way, but not very many. Yeah, I could I could definitely. And even like say 1961, and then I could go through the peppermint twist and all that. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I mean, you're your own radio station. I kind of am. I have music in my head constantly because I was able to pick out the instruments at an early age. From the beginning of of my appreciation of music, I've been able. I could hear a song and go, "Oh wow, piano, bass, drums. There's a saxophone, mm -hmm. and then you know background vocals and the bridge, and then a." there's a tambourine that comes in at a certain point. Mm -hmm. I've always been able to uh, break it down, break, break it down immediately. Yeah. And so when I replay it in my head, I can, I hear the production and I hear the instrumentation as well as the song and what the singer is, is singing. 
Yeah, I, I would like to have Ben Vaughn's ears to, for my next mixtape. Yeah, the problem, though, is I also have mem- uh, erasable memories of bad songs. So you might re- redo a bad song over because you forgot it was bad? No, no, I just hear that in my head, too. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't quite sort through this. That's, yeah, that's a yeah. bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, like, I, I remember everything I hear. That's the problem. <laughs> Be careful where you go. Yeah. Watch out for exercise classes. I don't know if it's an illness or not, but I, I personally will have at least one song or more go through my head throughout a day. At different times, I'll, a song will come into my head, and it'll just linger for a little bit and and go away. For a while, I was writing them down, and I made a mixtape based on every day the songs I would hear in my head that came up, and it was interesting to see what was going on with my weird brain. Yeah, I mean that, that's all I got. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean it's it's really interesting. There's that book, um, Oliver Sacks. Is that the guy's name mm-hmm, who wrote the, the brain who wrote, guy? Mm-hmm. And he wrote about there's some kind of um, condition that some people get where they hear a piece of music gets stuck in their brain and it will not leave and it just keeps repeating oh the earworm yeah he was talking about it's with older people uh he, he did some kind of study and there's a person in a, a retirement home or a nursing home who had that problem and he spent time with that person and they kept i think it was in the mood by glenn miller was the only song they heard in their head and it was constantly going which oh man <laughs> yeah you get old after a while that'd be worse yeah. than nostalgia <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you, you mentioned the n-word <laughs> <laughs> well, well and talking about making taping making mixtapes and stuff that was back in the day where um they were really promoting that home taping is destroying the music industry we were just making mixtapes, I guess, destroying the music. And it's still here. I guess we didn't destroy it. No, no. Um, do you remember when radio stations would play an enti- a, a brand new album would come oh, out? Yeah. And they say, mm-hmm. you know, Sunday night at 10 o'clock, we're going to play the, the new Tom Petty record. Yeah. And we would and we would all queue up our tape recorders. Mm-hmm. I could see that uh, destroying the record industry. Something like that, where the entire album, side one, side two, is available for you to record. But a mixtape. It's kind of promotion, right? I know. I think the record industry ruined the record industry. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was us. <laughs> and I have and I have stories. <laughs> Stay tuned for part three with Ben yeah. Bond. <laughs> yeah, the, the bitter years. <laughs> Worse than nostalgia. <laughs> it worse. Yes. It'll make you cry. Well, I'm sensitive to our time. This has been so much fun. I've been looking forward to this, and indeed, it has uh, surpassed my expectations. Uh, But Ben, before we let you go, can you tell us what you're up to? Sure. I just got back from a tour of Spain. I'm I'm, uh, still very popular over there, which is amusing to me to be famous famous, uh, in a place like Spain. Uh, So it's sort of like a fantasy. I go there, and I'm big. I get recognized on the street and everything. It's, it's really funny. so cool. And then I come back here to my semi-invisible real life, you know. So I've been touring over over in Spain and France and Italy because that's where my records sold. In the 80s, when I put out records, they did okay in America, but they did really well in those three countries, which is are the three countries you want to be popular in. Yeah, true. Spain, Spain, Italy, and France, the romantic language countries. Mm-hmm. And so I go over there on tour, and um, I have just started a reissue record label called Relay Shack Records. And I just hired staff, and I have distribution, and I have manufacturing all lined up. Oh, wow. And I'm going to be uh, finding records that have been out of print for a long time that need to be back in print with some elaborate packaging. A lot of record store day stuff coming up. Yeah. In my in my future with this. So that's what I'm spending a lot of my time on right now. That's terrific. That yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's really great. I have um, probably about six or seven releases set up and then we're right now licensing the masters and getting the publishing sorted out. So kind of queued up. Queued up. Yes. Is it just vinyl or vinyl and CD? Uh, vinyl, uh, definitely vinyl. 
uh, with elaborate packaging, you know, accompanying yeah. book booklets and things like that, and CD, and uh, and also streaming. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. Wow. That's what um, because it's interesting because I was on a label called Enigma Records back in the '80s, and I'm sure Bill, you know this label. <laughs> yeah, I probably have some of your records on that. Yeah, I was on Restless Records, which was a, uh, a subsidiary of Enigma, and Enigma was owned by this guy Bill Hine. And every time I would be on tour, you know, I was a New Jersey guy. So uh, being in California, sitting in their office, strategizing was not possible. But when we were on tour, I would visit the office and I would sit down with Bill Hine, who was the president, and talk about my career and my releases and, you know, what their plans are. And that part of the conversation would always be over within five minutes. And then we would talk about our favorite records that should be. The, <laughs> <laughs> the good stuff. And, yeah. And so. 30 years later, we're out of contact for 30 years. And then he contacts me out of the blue and says, I'm addicted to your radio show. And uh -huh. I now own a pressing plant in Poland. Whoa. And I want to give you your own reissue label. And we'll do all the manufacturing and all the promotion and all the everything. Gee. Wow. That's cool. uh, you know, I, I love your choices. I know that you'll come up with great ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so we're just in the beginning stages of it. We haven't you know, announced any releases yet, but that's that's what's going on. That's so cool. Is that going to be announced pretty soon as far as what you're going to be putting out, or is that still a little ways away? A little ways away because the, um, you know, it's a, it's a long road to get licensing for old master recordings, finding out who actually owns them, and you got to negotiate for it. And Oh, I'll bet. And also, you know, gathering all the photographs and interviewing whoever's still alive that was involved in the making of the original record. And quality of the quality of the tapes. And sometimes you have to restore some of the quality of the tapes. Oh, yes. Yes. It's um, yeah, there's a lot of, a, you know, a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts be, before you're able to say, OK, this is cleared and we're putting it out. That's when we announce when we know we got it. Mm hmm. So it, we're, but we're working, you know, every day on it right now, right now. It's great. Well, this is really your wheelhouse. And I mean, this, this is what, this is what you were built to do is find these things and bring them back. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know my radio show was an audition reel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. No, that's really great. Well, yeah. Congratulations. Well, when you get a little further along, if you want to come back on the podcast and tell us how that's all working, we'd love to have you. Great. I would love to. And thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed talking to you and having you come back. And thank you too, Bill. It was uh, lovely to see you. This was a real joy. This was a lot of fun. This is like a passion project for me. Well, you guys are very easy to converse with. I feel like I've known you my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have. Yeah. yeah. Well, we probably <laughs> know you a long time. So <laughs> just through your music. Okay, here we go with nostalgia again. Please, I mean, seriously. Just, <laughs> yeah. Let's just stop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it, no, it was great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. A great conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. Don't forget to check out the show notes for additional information about this episode. And give us a like or a thumbs up on Podomatic or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd also love to have your support on Patreon. And get in touch. We'd love to hear from you through the internet or Twitter or whatever means works for you. And finally, thanks to Caffeine Creek for the theme music. <laughs>